Thank you very much, Kate, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you for all the organizers um, also behind the scenes of making this possible. And most importantly, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, out of the many meetings that, that take place by Zoom, and I wish I'd be able to chance to travel, this is really the one where it hurts the most that I don't get the chance to be with you in person. But uh, nevertheless, here we are. Um, I'm excited to be uh, with you here. Uh, before we get started, just uh, with a bunch of usual stuff here, my COIs, you should know that uh, my university has patented some of the brain simulation technology developed that is now commercialized by a company that I'm involved in. And I'm happy to answer questions if you have any concerns about this uh, afterwards. Also, uh, usually often people show the acknowledgement slide with the trainees at the end. But I figured I'm going to sort the slides by importance, and this is the most important slide. So this is a team, this is the Prolog Lab and the Carolina Center for Neurostimulation. And here are all the trainees who have been doing all the work that I get the chance to present to you today. I just get the privilege to travel to Australia. Uh, I mean, at least to speak to you on Zoom. Uh, but uh, these are the people who deserve all the credit for the stuff that I'll be sharing with you uh, today. Also, uh, just to clarify, uh, uh, I am not a physician. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a researcher. So nothing that I present uh, today should be misunderstood as medical advice in any shape or form. With that, uh, let, let, let's focus on uh, the problem we're all acutely aware of. Based on the statistics, it's a problem that affects most of our families and households. And what we're looking at here is that the dramatic and devastating increase in uh, anxiety and or uh, depressive disorder in households uh, caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, these are not just numbers. They affect uh, most of us in one or the other form, sometimes in quite dramatic ways. You know, needless to say, uh, we already had a mental health crisis before the pandemic, and the pandemic has made everything so much worse. This is a challenge we're facing as a field, and my hope is that the brain stimulation field can contribute novel and innovative treatments to help alleviate some of the sufferings and help address some of these many numerous terrible consequences uh, on mental health caused by the uh, pandemic we're currently experiencing. The approach we're ch choosing is the approach I assume all of you are very familiar with, and I call it, uh, in, in its shorthand, if you will, beyond the chemical imbalance in the brain. Uh, still, many of our undergraduate students uh, learn somehow in an introductory textbook that depression and other uh, serious mental illnesses and psychological disorders are caused by an imbalance in chemistry in patients' brain. Uh, if you trace that back, this is actually a marketing slogan and has very little to do with our current understanding of disease mechanisms and psychiatry. Rather, uh, when we talk about brain stimulation, as you're acutely aware of, we're not, we're not that much uh, thinking about this smaller scale of molecules and receptors, but rather we're actually taking quite a shortcut by addressing this uh, intermediate level of networks and network activity patterns uh, based on the insight that the final causal driver of behavior and changes in behavior in uh, diseases such as depression are actually caused by alterations in network activity patterns. So shifting our uh, perspective away from that molecular level has turned out to be a promising approach over the last few uh, decades in brain simulation research. And obviously, I don't have time uh, to, 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 to give that credit and to discuss all of that with you. Rather, I'm going to focus on the few specific, specific things our group uh, has been working on. And again, just to kind of get us all on the same page and re remind ourselves, the, the approach we're taking here is really based on this fundamental insight. At the end of the day, the brain is actually an electrical system that generates uh, sophisticated electric signals that can be measured across uh, uh, spatial scales from the activity of individual synapses and neurons in preclinical animal models, all the way to these macroscopic non-invasive signals as shown here measured by EEG uh, in the shape of an alpha oscillation. Now, uh, many of you are probably very familiar with EEG or the non-invasive measurement of these macro scale uh, network activity signatures uh, as shown here in a research setup in the bottom left. The, the one thing that I wanna remind us of, and I think this will have relevance for our field is that at this point there are consumable and variable devices 
uh, consumer grade devices that can actually pick up at least some of these basic uh, activity uh, waveforms as shown here in top right from one of many uh, variable devices I've tested that quite reliably was able to pick up uh, this basic human brain rhythm, the alpha oscillation that I'll be speaking more about. So uh, let's just keep this in mind while a lot of the EEG data I'll be talking to you today comes from research grade recordings in a lab. There's really a lot of uh, potential and promise to translate uh, this technology into at home uh, devices that could be uh, delivered to patients at, at, at scale. Now, conceptually, scientifically, underneath everything I want to talk to you today is actually this historic paper. And this paper was published a few years after the first description of the EEG, when still many scientists doubted that one could indeed measure electric brain activity in a non invasive way from the scalp. Uh, this paper got published. And this is a revolutionary paper because it redefined a neurological disorder that has been described since ancient times, namely epilepsy, as a paroxysmal cerebral dysrhythmia or as an alteration or disorganization of brain rhythms. For those of you not familiar with epilepsy, I'm showing you here two uh, electrophysiology recording from an animal model where to the left you see physiological brain activity that clearly exhibits uh, mul a multiple time scales rhythmic structure versus the right from the br same brain circuit after pharmacological insult, uh, you see an electrographic seizure that is also rhythmic in activity structure, but the waveform and the properties are quite distinct. So this is almost 100 years ago, and, uh, and in neurology, uh, this is still um, how this uh, disease gets uh, diagnosed and tracked, mostly based on visual inspection of, this, of the changes in rhythmic structure in these network scale uh, EEG signals. What I want to uh, 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 emphasize or propose to you today is that this rhythmic synchronization can be altered in many ways, not, not always in a pathological way, rather as we start to understand now, uh, the synchronization between activity, rhythmic activity signals in multiple brain areas is actually a functional communication mode, a way how information flows in the brain. And here in a cartoon-like demonstration of real data where we recorded from two nodes in the dorsal attention network in an animal, what you see in red and blue is the phase or the timing of the oscillation. And you see to the left in the part of the task where the animal has to pay attention, the two signals from the parietal cortex are tightly synchronized or shared the timing Whereas doing part of the task where the animal does not need to pay attention, you see how the red and the blue rhythmic signals or the representation of the phase of these rhythmic signals start to, to, to shift and desynchronize. So in other words, uh, as signal processing has improved over the last hundred years and especially over the last few decades, we're now able to find much more subtle modulation of these oscillatory signatures, both as potential mechanism of cognition behavior, but also in terms of uh, alterations and pathological impairment that could underlie other brain disease states uh, beyond uh, epilepsy. Now, this fundamental insight that there is a link between electrical signaling and life or behavior actually it goes back to an old discovery many of you might be familiar with, shown here in the bottom right, where the discovery was made that electricity uh, makes muscles move, that electricity is a life force as it was called back then, and uh, what is really uh, interesting about these original experiments is that it introduced this causal framework where electricity was applied with this apparatus shown here on this slide to demonstrate that indeed, as we impose electric activity, that generates a behavioral output, in this case, movement of, the, of these frog-like muscles. Now, what you might be less aware of, uh, which I think is, um, uh, one, very problematic, and, and two, very representative, unfortunately, still how science is done and communicated today, that uh, the textbook tells you that uh, Galvani made this discovery, uh, but this is actually incorrect. It was Lucia Galeazzi, Galvani's wife, who made this very important discovery and um, has not gotten up to today uh, the recognition for making this fundamental discovery our entire field is based on. If that sounds familiar to you, our science uh, uh, works even today. Uh, sadly, I have to agree with you. And I think there's an entire agenda that we need to focus on, on improving our community and giving credit where credit is due and creating opportunities 
such there is an uh, equality and ultimate the equity of all different people who contribute to this field. Now, that original discovery was actually very quickly translated. So hundreds of years before translational research was a good cash phrase to secure grant funding, actually Galeazzi's uh, nephew Giovanni Aldini created this apparatus shown here, which is probably one of the first transcranial direct current stimulation or TDCS apparatus as it would be called today, actually for the treatment of this uh, man shown here, which had what we would call today major depressive disorder. So uh, the history repeats itself. And of course we've made progress since then, but I feel it's important to remind ourselves that some of these fundamental concepts have been around at this point for hundreds of years. So how much progress have we made? Where are we today in contrast to that, uh, or in comparison to that voltaic pile DC stimulation from a few hundred years ago? Here's an example from our group, uh, and I just show this one because I'm most familiar with that, but there are uh, several studies at this point like that one. And what the study has done, what we've done here is we leverage access to the human brain and epilepsy patients to have electrodes implanted for clinical purposes. And what we've done is one, we have these patients while they're in the hospital, we have them do a computer-based cognitive task, in this case, a working memory task, and we recorded their brain activity more specifically with then multi-site recordings to extract the frequency-specific synchronization in different parts of the networks involved in cognitive control, in this case, working memory. What we've done then is we use these activity signatures to design a stimulation paradigm. So we've stimulated uh, through the very same electrodes in the brain that we recorded from an applied rhythmic uh, low amplitude stimulation synchronized between the different nodes, the nodes of the network that we targeted to understand if such stimulation and uh, enhancement of these activity patterns could actually uh, improve uh, uh, working memory. And uh, if we can do that, that would be a quite direct demonstration of a causal role of such network synchronization uh, in, in, in working memory in this case. So to the bottom left, without going into details, what I'm showing you here is uh, performance measures accuracy on this task in light yellow is the sham stimulation versus yellow, uh, dark yellow and orange are the two uh, synchronized in-phase and, uh, and anti-phase stimulation paradigms that in these patients reported here all quite substantial improved working memory uh, accuracy. Now, uh, that is a behavioral output and uh, our field is uh, full of studies where we stimulate and uh, measure some cognitive behavior or symptom outcome, but what's really important in between is to understand if we actually successfully managed to modulate the underlying network function and um, what I'm showing you here, just very briefly to the right, is that indeed in comparison to sham, there was a significant increase in coherence and measure of synchronization between the electrodes uh, across this network that we stimulate either in phase or anti phase, demonstrating what we call successful target engagement or modulation of the targeted uh, network level substrate. Now, uh, thankfully, uh, very few patients uh, need electrodes in their brain for clinical purposes. So uh, the world that, that many of you live in uh, consists of non-invasive uh, measurement of activity through EEG or other electrophysiology strategies and the application of uh, brain simulation in non-invasive ways. So what I would like to focus on is uh, transcranial alternating current simulation or TACS which in essence is the application of a low amplitude sine wave electric current to the scalp, a small fraction of the delivered electricity reaches the brain as an electric field. And we and others have shown in the last 10 years that neurons and networks of neurons are actually incredibly susceptible to a smartly timed low amplitude perturbations of the membrane voltage, such as the ones resulting from such electric fields applied uh, by TACS. Now, uh, many of you are perhaps more familiar with TDCS, which is the use of a constant uh, low amplitude electric current for brain stimulation. More than 20 years ago, there was a series of pioneering papers showing that in a uh, polarity dependent way, the application of a low amplitude constant current to motor cortex would modulate motor cortex excitability. And uh, we revisited that question recently uh, because we were very curious uh, about the robustness uh, of this finding. And what we've done was a placebo controlled uh, crossover uh, study 
where we have not uh, used the original simulation paradigm, but rather we um, increase the amplitude of the stimulation and, and the current density uh, and added additional constraints on who was in the study and how we performed the study to try to maximize the, the effect we could find and minimize heterogeneity. Uh, even we were surprised by the clarity of the results shown here at the bottom left, measuring peripheral MEP output after uh, anodal or cathodal TDCS and sham stimulation that shown indeed in agreement with the literature of bidirectional modulation of motor cortex excitability. Now, again, there's something intermediate between stimulation and ultimate output, and that's uh, a change in brain activity. So to the right, I'm showing you the uh, uh, vocal potentials by TMS that showed the according uh, bidirectional modulation that correlated with the change in MEP. So uh, this study, while perhaps uh, uh, unusual in its clarity for our field, uh, given uh, how rigorous it has been designed and executed, uh, has instilled a lot of confidence in me personally that we're on the right track and that the literature that's developed over the years of uh, low amplitude electric fields can indeed out the brain uh, excitability uh, will hold up. Now, uh, one thing which I would like to remind uh, ourselves is that just because we find this effect of motor cortex, it doesn't mean shifting around the electrodes to other brain areas that have been implicated in other types of behavior output and or symptom manifestation will have an equally clear effect. And I think that's something the field uh, is grappling with. But um, I'm gonna let this uh, question um, uh, sit there for now and shift back to the use of periodic sine wave instead of constant current. And this is an animal experiment in a dish that illustrates the basic principle where we have your action potentials uh, drawn as these vertical lines, the temporal line up or synchronized to the applied sine wave waveforms, uh, demonstrating that rhythmic networks indeed and engage or synchronize to low amplitude periodic input. And very importantly, is there something to do with that the network on its own is already endogenous, like generating this oscillation and the stimulation just helps to adjust and improve the timing of the neural activity. It is not strong enough to a, a exogenously impose a rhythmic uh, activity pattern. Now the question is, uh, how do we best stimulate? And the answer, after lots of research from us and, and others is, is, is strikingly simple and actually uh, agrees with all findings about mechanical clocks and metronomes and the effect of periodic input, which is if you have an, a, a rhythmically active network or a neural um, oscillation, the best waveform to entrain and enhance this waveform is a frequency matched waveform. And what you see is a set of computer simulations where we vary the stimulation amplitude and the X the simulation frequency, pardon me, the x-axis, and the simulation amplitude and the y-axis, and we investigated in all in every little plot this is a single simulation looking at the effect on neural oscillation. What you find your color code is inverted triangle center at three hertz, which was the endogenous frequency of that network. And you see how the stimulation and, and trained to enhance the oscillation, and the more the further up you go in the plot, meaning the stronger stimulation amplitude the broader range of frequencies at which uh, the stimulation successfully entrained the network. This is called the Arnold tongue and has been around quite a bit in the dynamic systems literature and was kind of um, inspiring and also uh, very surprising to me originally that even in these uh, sophisticated complex models of, of brain networks, we find the same basic um, uh, dynamical systems principles. One thing I'd like to point out here to the right is that the actual stimulation parameter combinations are the stimulation at the opposite effect and suppress the oscillation. And this just demonstrates that studies where we uh, choose a specific stimulation paradigm and just measure behavior output without understanding what actually change in neural activity can be very tricky because the stimulation may have uh, 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 unintuitive um, effects on the network uh, dynamics. Now, the presence of this Arnold tongue and this principle of tuning simulation uh, frequency has been a theoretical concept that uh, showed up in numerous computer simulations. But recently, uh, with the support of the uh, Brain Initiative, we had the chance to um, test that for the presence of the Arnold tongue in an animal model system. So this is uh, electrophysiology in the ferret model. And we chose the ferret because the ferret exhibits alpha oscillations uh, like humans, this basic offline inhibitory top-down control rhythm that the standard lab wrote in stone. And what we've done here is apply TACS 
very similar to what we would do in humans. And we investigate at the level of individual action potentials, whether changes in the simulation frequency here on the x-axis versus change in simulation amplitude had an effect on entrainment, which is color coded. And lo and behold, we found the same armal tongue or inverted uh, triangle. Uh, what I want to point out is if you compare the top two plots, there's actually a cell type specific effect where the presumed inhibitor interneurons of fast spiking cells exhibit a much more pronounced armal tongue than the presumed uh, pyramidal cells or excitatory regular spiking cells. So that's quite interesting, but it makes sense because when we looked at the coupling of these cell types to the overall EEG rhythms, uh, we found that um, the narrow spiking cells exhibit much tighter coupling to the overall network macroscopic activity signature. So by modulating after simulation, we would expect these neurons to show a clearer effect. Now, going back to this controversy or discussion of what a low amplitude electric field can or cannot do, the bottom two plots in purple uh, show the firing rate, and you don't see any consistent power of change in the firing rate, further confirming that this low amplitude uh, simulation waveforms modulate the timing of individual action potentials, but do not alter the overall uh, firing rate. Now, with these insights and this me more mechanistic understanding of how these low amplitude perturbations can change uh, network dynamics, the question is, how do we turn this into a potential treatment paradigm? So the approach we're following, uh, uh, we call rational design, uh, a, a, a term uh, borrowed from the pharmaceutical industry. And the three steps here are essentially, first, we need to identify a target. Now, a target in this case is not a receptor or a molecule or a biochemical pathway, but rather it's a network level activity signature in the form of some type of rhythmic activity. So in the bottom here, I'm showing you uh, the corresponding plots from a target engagement study we had done in patients with low, low, chronic low back pain. And the question here is really, do we find a brain rhythm or an oscillatory signature that correlates with the symptom of interest? Now that doesn't demonstrate yet that this activity power is causing the symptoms, but it gives us a potential target. And what we found is, that these alpha frequency rhythms in sensor a motor cortex, uh, their amplitude was negatively correlated with symptom severity uh, sh shown here in this topographic plot of the correlation coefficients, meaning the more severe the chronic low back pain, the more reduced or, uh, or impaired uh, was the amplitude of these um, alpha or mu oscillations. So the question then is, can we use stimulation or in this case, can we use TACS to restore or increase the amplitude of these oscillations. And that's really the question if we can successfully engage the target, which requires EEG measurements, in this case, before and after stimulation, which also requires a, a judicious choice of control conditions to ensure that indeed the stimulation uh, was the cause of the effect we observe. And what I'm showing you here is when we compare uh, alpha TACS uh, to a placebo or sham TACS, that indeed there was a statistically significant increase in alpha oscillation power in the areas of interest as shown in this uh, top of plot here. So that is uh, helpful because it shows that simulation has the intended effect on the network dynamics. But the question then is, did that really alter uh, the symptoms of chronic low back pain? And uh, the answer is yes. But even more importantly, the question uh, that we want to address is whether the change in symptoms correlated with the change in the target brain activity patterns. If the two of them correlate, we really uh, can start to speculate about causality and we have a targeted treatment. Indeed, what we found here was that the, the immediate uh, transient symptom relief in these participants correlated with the uh, amount of um, uh, increase or restoration of the alpha oscillation. And I would argue that the, st the studies we're doing as a field should have these three elements. I also want to point out, I used the chronic low back pain story as an example, because this is one of the few stories we've done where all these elements always align. It's perfectly normal, given how little we know about all this, that um, not all these results uh, across these three stages quite line up, but I feel it's very important that we openly report this because based on that, the field can uh, develop uh, and evolve. Another example where we also targeted presumed pathological hyperexcitability, uh, in this case, in auditory cortex in patients with schizophrenia of medication uh, refractory auditory hallucinations. 
And what we found here is that again, alpha PACS increased the power of alpha oscillation that's shown in this topographic maps. Uh, this is, it was a five day paradigm, quite strikingly, but not reaching statistical significance threshold. A week and a month later, we still saw some effect uh, in that frequency band from stimulation uh, for the first time hinting at that repeat stimulation could really strengthen these oscillatory patterns in a way that these changes persist beyond the immediate uh, time window uh, after stimulation. The question then is, if you change one aspect of the complex multi-scale, multi-frequency uh, landscape of brain activity, what else changes? And in this case, we looked at a, a more or less standard way of describing uh, alterations in auditory processing in patients with schizophrenia, Namely, we looked at the response of the brain or the synchronization of the brain to a 40 hertz auditory click drain input, which is known and has been many times shown to be reduced in patients with schizophrenia. What we found that in the TACS group of this double blind placebo controlled trial, but not in the TDCS and sham or placebo control groups, we found actually an increase in or a restoration of that auditory entrainment to the 40 hertz signal suggesting that by altering this low frequency, long range oscillations, the alpha oscillations, we also induce potentially beneficial uh, restoration of more local, uh, smaller spatial scale and faster frequency activity signatures of auditory processing. Now, that, that is nice, but what does this all mean, right? Going back to that third point of validating that this target was actually a meaningful target. Well, what we found in this study quite strikingly is that the change in response to that auditory click train or the intertrial phase coherence shown here on the X axis actually correlated with the change in the symptom scale, the auditory hallucination rating scale. So in other words, the more the patients had a restoration or increase uh, in or normalization of that auditory response at 40 Hertz, the more the auditory hallucination symptoms were actually reduced linking back together a really high order clinical assessment of uh, these hallucinations that span from basic perceptual properties all the way to a more kind of affective tone and the implications of the symptoms to patients back to a very basic network level synchronization measure uh, in the auditory system. Now, uh, there is more to it. So this is a uh, recently published uh, case study fully recognizing the lower grade of evidence in a case study, but essentially we've administered here uh, 20 weekly sessions of TACS. And when we look at this uh, symptom scale overall, uh, there was not, no major change. However, this participant actually submitted to us at the end of the study and gave us permission to analyze a very detailed diary of um, their experience by being in the study and receiving this weekly uh, TACS stimulation. Right around here in week nine, where we've drawn this gray line, uh, there's something really interesting in there where the participant says essentially, I was probably wrong when at the beginning of the study, I told the research personnel that I don't have control over these auditory hallucinations because I realize now that I have some level of control. And that's quite remarkable. And when we then kind of unpack this overall clinical score shown to the right, we found that in the items associated with controllability, a, a marketed and substantial uh, improvement. Now, if I may speculate, uh, remember we're targeting your long range alpha oscillations, which are kind of this top down cognitive control mechanism in general in the brain. And perhaps really what the stimulation does is uh, increasing the sense of control and ownership over some of these um, sensory illusions, if you will, or auto hallucinations, which could be a very exciting framework to bring together some concepts from cognitive neuroscience in, into our field for the development of new treatments. And it also highlights that using these composite clinical scales is fraught with challenges because we might miss really important signals that in this case, we have really just realized thanks to the uh, very active engagement of the participant in this study. Anyways, let me shift to another area that we have a lot of interest in, and I know you too, which is uh, mood disorders and uh, major depressive disorder uh, specifically. Uh, so the question there is, what is the right network level target? And that's a field of ongoing debate, as you know, but we essentially, a few years ago, started to be curious about, again, the alpha oscillation 
and this old, but at this point contested story about an hemispheric um, asymmetry between the role of left frontal and right frontal cortex. Now, uh, while I don't think alpha oscillations are a direct marker of depression or alpha symmetry the way perhaps in a simplified way some of us had originally hoped, I just want to demonstrate here that in this kind of study where we collated data across trials, the basic findings about left frontal cortex associated with behavioral approach system where an increase in alpha oscillation, meaning a deactivation corresponds to reduced behavior approach, and then vice versa, the right hemisphere uh, frontal areas as uh, the location or one of the network nodes of behavior inhibition where an increase in alpha oscillations there would correspond to reduced behavior inhibition. That finding and others have published before us were able to replicate quite clearly. So there is some role of frontal alpha oscillation in these perhaps trait-like processes that may relate to depression, but how exactly remains a question to be seen. In fact, that alpha symmetry story got more interesting when we started to see if we can find in our data, and we did, but strikingly uh, only in women, and there was actually a strong correlation with testosterone levels, again, uh, from data collected across uh, several smaller studies we have done, uh, just making it more interesting and also more complex. In fact, when we then localize these signals, driving the asymmetry, strikingly we were able to localize them in the right and fear of frontal gyrus uh, that, that of course has been associated with kind of like the stopping or inhibiting of behavior. So there is something there, but it's probably more complex than we had all hoped for. Nevertheless, given this potential role, we have charged ahead and used TACS stimulating left and right frontal cortex in phase in the alpha frequency to understand if it could alter left frontal alpha oscillation if that would have an effect on depression and mood symptoms. Now, just very quickly, because it's been published three years ago, this was the first double-blind placebo-controlled uh, study of TACS in MDD. And what we found is that in patients who received alpha TACS, there was a marketed and statistically significant um, uh, uh, reduction in depression symptoms uh, when compared to placebo uh, over here. Now, what I wanna point out is as you can see from the screen lines, not all participants have responded. So, well, first that's not uncommon. In fact, that's very typical for um, uh, studies uh, that investigate treatments for treatment resistant depression, but also it demonstrates to us that we can do more in terms of understanding how this works and perhaps individualize or personalize the stimulation approach. Nevertheless, we thought this was promising, but again, the middle piece, right? Have we actually changed these brain networks? What has changed? And uh, strikingly, what we found is that by, as we had hypothesized, partially inspired by Andrew work, is that by stimulating left and right frontal cortex in synchrony, we actually caused a significant, significant, significant decrease in left frontal alpha oscillation, which would correspond to a decrease of the deactivation of the approach motivation system. And there are lots of double negatives in there. That's just the complexity of studying the system. Now, uh, at the follow-up two, none of that reached this significance. So clearly, uh, this is not the answer to everything. But importantly, we did not see a similar change in the sham group. So one thing that we're very interested in now is a little bit in, akin to that um, uh, case study of this patient with medication factor hallucination is to think about differently spaced stimulation paradigms. And in fact, this one of the participants in the original study uh, where we got approval because some of these patients reported got so much better that patients could elect to come back and get uh, uh, multiple months of weekly stimulation still blinded. And again, this is just a case report level of evidence, but you can see this participant came in with quite significant depression symptoms and uh, crossed then after several weeks of uh, what turned out to be 10 hertz TACS, that was the group they were assigned to, into a response and ultimately a remission. And you can see the same development kind of in the daily simple one to 10 Likert scale ratings uh, provided uh, by the participants. So I believe that's one direction that we can make a lot of uh, further progress to understand how to properly space uh, stimulation sessions to achieve this kind of, um, in this case, really wonderful uh, cl clinical outcome. Now, this is just one study, and one study, uh, though I believe in how careful we've done this and followed the gold standard methodology for clinical trials, it's still just one study. So recently, uh, we had the chance to address the same question in patient depression in a, just a single session 
where we uh, 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 measure the EG, apply TACS and measure the EG to ask whether that reduction left from the alpha oscillation was replicable. The paper just got accepted and it's also in a preprint server, but just real quick, we indeed found the selective and statistically significant reduction in left front loud for oscillations. And for comparison here is the inset as a result from the previous study. In other words, we're able to replicate that bifrontal in-phase um, alpha TACS reduced left frontal alpha oscillations. Now there's a larger story about connectivity and I, I, I invite you and encourage you to look at the preprint uh, for further discussion of that. But the one concern all these alpha oscillation studies uh, bring is that um, it's kind of, in some way, the alpha oscillation, right, is like this cartoon-like idea of just like how relaxed or aroused or activated you are. So how does that really relate to depression? So in that same study, we actually presented uh, the participants with these IAPS kind of standardized um, emotional eliciting images. And what we found in patients with depression that when we looked at the response in terms of alpha oscillations between positive and neutral images, we actually found this, act, this um, increase in left frontal alpha oscillations for positive versus neutral stimuli, which in some sense conceptually makes sense in depression patient that they see something that is uh, commonly perceived as positive, but does not activate uh, the behavior approach system uh, the way we would anticipate. In fact, when we then look at the effect of stimulation, it's quite striking that that decrease in left frontal alpha oscillation was actually specific as shown here to the right for the images of positive valence. So what the stimulation did was it restored, if you will, the activity signature of an approach motivation for positive stimuli. So it's not a general effect uh, about alpha oscillations, but it really has something to do with the response uh, to these positive versus neutral images, which I believe adds quite, quite something to the story in terms of understanding how these frontal alpha oscillations are indeed a promising target for the treatment of mood uh, disorders. Now, uh, that's the alpha oscillation story, but um, while this might be the only really obvious oscillation when you look at EEG, there are, as you know, many uh, more and different activity signatures. And one way how to get at those and get more clarity uh, of how they correlate or correspond to disease states and symptoms is to design paths that drive these networks. Here's an adaptation of the effort task where people get the option to either do an easy task for a low reward or do a hard task for a probabilistic but higher reward. And the task here is because it's a, an experimental model of what real life would look like is essentially a few button presses with index finger, which is easier for most people than a lot of button presses with their uh, pinky finger. So what happens when people have to decide trial to trial, do I wanna do the hard or the easy one? Well, as it turns out, participants have a di different appetite to choose the, the hard option. And that appetite or that percent time they choose the hard option correlates with a really interesting EEG signature, which is a phase amplitude coupling between frontal delta oscillation and uh, more posterior motor cortex area beta oscillations. So there's a specific activity signature as an index of how people are willing to do the hard option. And quite strikingly, that behavioral measure of percent time chosen the hard option actually had a statistically significant relationship with the anhedonia symptoms in these participants. So that task allows us to drive a network activity signature uh, of anhedonia. Now, this was not the only activity signature we found. The other thing uh, we looked at was uh, as people make this decision, if they want to do the hard uh, task or not trial by trial, they get told what money they could win. And we looked at how much that mattered, whether how high the high reward was. And as it turns out, the more that matter for your behavioral choice, the more we found an other low high frequency phase amplitude coupled signature, namely, the theta uh, gamma uh, synchronization uh, uh, as show, shown here in this topographic map. Now, importantly, and quite strikingly in the patient population in study, actually that sensitivity to what exactly the reward was on the, um, on the harder task correlated with trade anxiety as measured by the state trade anxiety index. So these two activity signatures, the delta beta coupling and the theta gamma coupling really might actually map onto these two 
uh, crucial and perhaps quite orthogonal dimensions of depression, right? The anhedonia component and the more anxiosomatic component. Now, having extracted these activity patterns, the question is, can we actually target them with TACS? And just very quickly, because it's also been published recently here in Healthy Controls, where we designed a task to elicit the same type of delta, beta, and theta uh, gamma stimulation, we actually designed TACS paradigms to mimic uh, those uh, phase amplitude coupled waveforms as shown here. And uh, strikingly, what we found is that we were able to selectively modulate, in this case, not two symptom dimension, but two cognitive dimensions uh, selectively. And also, when we looked at the EEG uh, interleaf of the task, we found the corresponding uh, successful target engagement suggesting that these more sophisticated uh, EEG level network signals that map onto this, these uh, different dimensions of the psychiatric illnesses of suppression really serve as a uh, promising stimulation target for TACS and other non-invasive brain simulation modalities where our main dimension of control and parameter choice is really the temporal structure of the waveform. Now, uh, just to wrap up, where, where do we go from here? Uh, what is next? Uh, as I've just shown you, um, uh, you know, a, a brain rhythm and an EEG signal is not a sine wave. There's a lot of complexity to it, as um, uh, multiple research groups are now finding. And uh, one way to go that I uh, assume many of you are also interested in is to start to develop simulation waveforms that capture more and more of these uh, endogenous features. If you're interested in that, I'd like to point you to a review that um, my superstar postdoc Justin Riddle and I have just published. And by the way, the vast majority of the human work I've shown you was all his work over the last few years, uh, where we make a, a number of proposals of what simulation waveforms the field could um, investigate next. Now, one way how to make the simulation waveform more endogenous, which is still very poorly understood, is to use closed loop or feedback stimulation, where we in real time adapt the stimulation waveform to change in brain activity uh, patterns. Shifting gears a little bit in terms of clinical applications, uh, we recently reviewed um, here in the bottom the existing uh, double-blind placebo-controlled uh, trials of TACS, and uh, there are very few of them. And uh, we map out in this article kind of practically how to do these studies in the hope that we can excite more clinicians and clinical researchers and brain simulation research in general to start pursuing these trials. And then I. Through Zoom, I don't get to see you and who you are, but I'm pretty sure uh, many of you in the audience are thinking or working along these lines, and I hope there will be convergence in the ability to exchange ideas and collaborate to move um, this field forward. Now, finally, uh, brain stimulation isolation will probably end up where medication has ended up, which is um, it helps some patients, but not all patients. And I personally believe the next step forward here is to think synergistically and one combination I'm personally very excited about is the combination with psychotherapy and other psychosocial interventions because the effect of brain stimulation is fundamentally state dependent. And there's no better way to control or adjust state, especially in patient psychological disorders, is through some of these evidence-based psychotherapy modalities. So I believe at the intersection of these different methods uh, lie the future and we'll be able uh, if we collaborate together as a field and approach this with an open mind and open hearts, we can really bring about uh, dramatic and fundamental improvements for the many patients with psychiatric disorders who currently do not get the relief that is served from available treatment and interventions. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention, again, for inviting me and organizing this. I've already mentioned at the beginning, the team has done all the amazing work that um, I have the privilege to present to you. And of course, I would also like to thank the funding sources that have been in a very faithful way with us, despite all the crazy ideas we've come up with over the years. Uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Flavia. That was a that was a fantastic um, presentation with a lot of really key things. Um, I think for us to think about, in particular, the rational design or the the experimental therapeutic approach, it's critical. Something I think we all need to be doing. Um, and that was a really beautiful sort of uh, presentation of that. Now, um, we do have a little bit of time for questions and there's a few that have come through. Um, so firstly from uh, Nigel Rojash, um, thanks Flavio, really interesting talk. The MEPTP findings from the TDCS study was striking. Um, reproducibility in brain stim is a real challenge. 
Do you have any thoughts or insights as to why some groups can get these clear findings where others do not? You're sorry, you're on mute, Flavio. Sorry about that. You would think after one and a half years of pandemic, you <laughs> might uh, Great, great question. And um, uh, we've gotten called out for these results in a very positive way because they are strikingly clear. Uh, uh, also to our own surprise. And we've actually recently published a letter in brain stimulation response to that letter explaining what's going on. So if you look at the meta-analysis of all these TDCS studies there have been about 30 or 40 probably on motor cortex excitability. There's no study uh, that used the cumulative dose uh, in terms of amplitude and current density as we have. So that's one aspect. Small changes, two versus two and a half versus one and a half milliamps make a big difference. The other thing is this study probably lacks external validity quite a bit because we so severely constrained who we were able to enroll the study. And I have to refer you to that article for details, but essentially these are all on the right, right handed young males with lots of extra constraints and also lots of methodological details in terms of using urine navigation and other other trickeries to be as precise and replicable across um, study sessions as possible. Okay, and just uh, one more quick question, um, which I think is, is quite interesting, um, and I'm going to paraphrase it. So this is from Anthea um, Stein. Do you see TACS becoming a more popular intervention compared to TD TDCS in clinical populations in the future? Ah, that's very, that's a wonderful question. I don't know the answer to this. So. Um, you know, I mean, we've done this TDCS study because I got so frustrated, but as many of us, by all the negative results in larger clinical trials of TDCS. So I figured, let's just go back to the basics. And if we can't replicate the basic effect, then I don't need to think about TDCS anymore. And then I got the cleaner, more impressive result than I've ever gotten for any TACS study. So I'm the wrong person to ask this question, at least but it's an outstanding question. I do believe with TACS, it's a little bit more clear how we can target specific network dynamics, but I think the field is just behind. It's a newer field and we might end up, we have not yet done a multi-site TACS trial, let alone an international multi-site clinical trial of TACS for the treatment of depression. So uh, TACS might end up equally confusing and we're just earlier in the innovation cycle or the additional targeting ability will really make a difference. If it does, TDCS will not be dead because TDCS clearly does modulate plasticity. And one thing we haven't answered yet is how can we make these TACS induced effects persist? So in my um, infinite game mindset, ultimately we'll find out the right strategic combination of both for the most effective treatments for these patients. Absolutely. Okay, so um, that's all the time that we have. Thank you so much, Flavio, for a fantastic presentation. Um, and if everyone wants to jump on the next session, that'd be great. Thank you very much.